We will now continue with the case discussion presented by Christian Salas and Andrea Boone. And before they start, I want to explicitly invite the audience to post their questions about their own challenges regarding botulinum and toxin treatment in the chat function. Hopefully, Christian and Andrea can answer your questions during the subsequent Q&A. For the first case I would like to present is a case where um, ultrasound can really be helpful in identifying uh, active muscles in myoclonia or tremor and also how to inject these uh, muscles. It's a man, 53 years of age, and um, um, presented with continuous myoclonia of the uh, wrist and um, uh, hand due to a lesion of the medial nerve of the upper arm. And clinically, uh, due to flexion of the wrist, uh, suspected was that activity occurred in the flexor carpi radialis. So ultrasound um, can helpful to uh, visualize this activity. So on the next slide, I will demonstrate a movie on this activity. So the activity mainly occurs in the flexor carpi radialis. And um, yeah. Injection of this muscle is pretty easy, uh, um, especially when with, with help of the ultrasound. The next case is also a case where ultrasound can really be helpful in identifying active muscles, in this case focal myoclonia as well. It's a female, 24 years of age, with one year um, complaints of a moving toe of the left foot and movement in the lateral part of the lower left leg. Here you can see a movie of the uh, movements of the toes of the left foot. And especially the second and third toe are moving. This is from another angle. So if we then look at uh, the ultrasound movies, the flexor dictorum brevis is active in this area. And the flexor dictorum profundus in the lower leg is active over here. Both pretty easy to inject with, with ultrasound. So next is a case of a patient with uh, hypercyaluroid, where injection of the submandibular gland is uh, shown. And I think ultrasound can be, be really helpful uh, in injecting these glands. Um, it's often um, performed in ALS patients or Parkinson's patients with hypercyaluroid. And there are three glands, of which two are the most important glands to, um, to inject. Uh, the first gland is the sublingualis gland, which only produces, produces three to five um, uh, percent of the total salivary uh, volume. The um, glandula submandibularis, it's important in the unstimulated saliva secretion. So normally with the injection scheme, I start with this gland. Uh, especially when patients have drooling uh, outside um, um, uh, episodes which can be stimulating, like uh, eating or uh, speaking. Uh, but if that is the case, then the uh, glandular parotis can be uh, really helpful in um, uh, downsizing these, um, these complaints. And um, if uh, injection of the submandibular gland is not helpful enough, then I add the parotid gland uh, to it. So here you can see the um, uh, ultrasound image of the uh, glandula submandibularis. Uh, and I chose an in-plane uh, approach uh, here, just parallel to the jaw uh, over there. And um, you can appreciate that it's really difficult to um, um, 
go to the capsule of the um, submandibularis gland. Um, this capsule is part of the superficial layer of the deep cervical fasci, and uh, you really need, need to push a little bit to, to go through it. Um, and if you go not uh, deep enough, then you put the botulin, uh, botulinum toxin outside this capsule, which can um, provoke uh, swallowing difficulties. So here you see the needle with the needle tip. And tissue is, is positioned um, uh, away. Um, and um, so now I uh, see that I'm in there. I place a little bit of volume. You see a little bit of air there. And when I uh, satisfied, uh, then I place the total amount uh, within the um, within this uh, gland. So this is a quick clinical case we'll go over looking at using Botox for chemodenovation. This was a 42-year-old man from Texas who. Um, was in excellent general health, but he'd had the stroke when he was wrestling in his dorm room as a like 20 year old and had sustained a spastic left hemiparesis that he had been left with. He was very functional despite this. He works in the family real estate business, works full time. He also likes to um, coach his kids at, um, at baseball and stay very active. So he came to see me at the Mayo Clinic to see if there was anything we could do about his spasticity and basically improve his overall function. He wanted to be able to throw better with his left hand. He is left-handed um, to walk more normally. And he had tried Botox on a couple of different occasions, but many years ago, and he didn't think that it had worked at all. So on examination, um, he has a fairly mild weakness, but quite moderate spasticity, um, walks with slight circumduction, you have, carries his left arm and elbow flexion and adducted at the shoulder with the wrist pronated and flexed. So this is him stretching out his left arm. Um, that's as far as it would go. So we actually initially started him on gabapentin and stretching twice daily because he wasn't doing anything like that yet. Um, and he noticed a big improvement in his function just with that. He was able to run on the treadmill. He was able to throw a baseball with his kids. Um, so he was pretty happy, but he still noted that his hand was catching on his side, uh, that his elbow was quite flexed, and some tightness in his hamstring and gastroc. So he came up to Mayo in December of last year, and we started with an initial dose of 400 units because we were doing the arm and the leg. We put 125 in the medial hamstring, um, 75 in the medial gastroc and soleus. And then in the arm, we, we targeted the pronated teres, the flex carpi radialis, the flex digitorum superficialis, and the brachioradialis. So we started pretty conservatively because he has good strength and I didn't want to weaken him too much. Um, so he reported back to me um, that it had been less than 48 hours and his forearm was feeling much looser. Um, he was doing the same stretches as before, but was noticing that there was dramatic um, improvement in the pronator tightness. Um, and But he noticed that his fingers were still tight or his wrist was still tight as his fingers were touching his leg when he was walking and felt that the leg was still a bit tight. So then he came back in person and at five months uh, follow up in May and overall felt that he had a good response, but that the forearm was still tight, the finger and wrist flexes and the brachioradialis was what he pointed out. So in May, we changed the dose a little bit. We went up to 500 units total. And instead of doing the hamstring and the gastroc, um, I didn't do those at all this time, but I just did the soleus 100 units. 50 on the medial and 50 on the lateral aspect of that muscle. And then I bumped up the pronator teres a little bit. I also added in the flexor carpi ulnaris in addition to the flexor carpi radialis. So they both got 50 units this time. Um, the flexor digitorum superficialis went down a little bit, but added some into the flexor digitorum profundus um, on the fourth and fifth digits. So overall, he got 75 units in the finger flexors. The brachioradialis, we went up a little bit. 
to 75 units, and then we added in the biceps and brachialis with 100 units at two, 50 units at two sites. And this was his impression that overall the arm is looser compared to a year ago before we started all of this. Um, he thought that there were quite a few areas that we didn't inject in May that we had injected in December and that they still hadn't tightened up yet as he thought they would. So he was getting some carryover and just overall improving his function. So it wasn't just the Botox. I think the gabapentin and the stretching was really helping too. He noticed that he couldn't snap the fingers on his left hand, but that uh, that weakness effect was already starting to come back compared to even two weeks earlier. This was about a, a month in, I think, when he sent me this message. And then the current plan is for more injections in October. So I'll see him back next month and we'll just have to assess where he's at. Um, you know, we I always usually pre-authorize an extra 100 units. So if I wanted to, I could go up to 600 units, but I, I would really rather keep the dose as low as possible, especially in someone like this, where he has excellent function and you, you just don't want to wreck those muscles um, with the repeated Botox injections if you can avoid it. So that's one, that's an example of a case where you're trying to maintain function, but ameliorate the spasticity to improve function without losing a lot of strength. A lot of the patients that we do, they don't have any function. And so you really don't have to be quite as careful. You're just trying to improve spasticity to allow for better hygiene, better positioning, less pain.